some of the data from uh, several different databases suggests that there's a fair minority of patients with uh, what's defined as unresectable stage three that kind of never make it to definitive chemo radiotherapy uh, for whatever reason. In many databases, it's 25, 30 percent of the patients that may may never get into the system where they have the opportunity to be treated with concurrent chemo radiotherapy. And just want to get get your thoughts on that. Sure. Well, I think the answer to that question is probably multifactorial. Um, I do see a fair amount of patients who are diagnosed with stage 3 lung cancer in the hospital. Um, they're evaluated by an internal medicine team. And I think there tends to still be a nihilistic view yeah. of stage 3 lung cancer, um, that it's really not worth undergoing treatment, that the toxicities of treatment are, are so much that the patient who may seem frail in the hospital really can't tolerate it. But I think, number one, it's really hard to evaluate somebody for curative therapy when they're hospitalized. Performance statuses will change once somebody recovers from, you know, potentially the infection that put them in the hospital and, and so forth. Um, and I really think that the patient deserves to meet with a radiation oncologist, a medical oncologist, and at times a surgeon to really assess if they are a candidate for these therapies. I think there are, to, to, to your point, many of these patients have long-standing relationships with their primary care doctors. Uh, there's, there's that trust with the doctor, and if the doctor doesn't believe that it's worth, um, you know, being seen and evaluated, and to your point, um, you know, it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a tough journey through chemo, radiotherapy, and stuff like that. We talked at the time of staging about the importance of tumor board. The tumor board, I think, is a really nice setting to educate pulmonologists interventional radiologists, thoracic surgeons about, you know, the, the benefits of uh, therapies that don't involve them, right? Uh, um, so thoughts about that in terms of uh, educating other, other disciplines? Uh, I, I know there's been a lot of effort through the, their national organizations. Uh, I've been involved in the past with the American College of Chest Physicians and trying to make sure that a pulmonologist understand that, to your point, Joe, that, that, that Things have changed in 30 years, right? Mm -hmm. Lots of things that have changed in 30 years, and we need to have a more or less nihilistic approach or a non-nihilistic approach mm -hmm. and give patients uh, opportunities. Mm -hmm. no, Others have thoughts? Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I agree with that. I think that one of the key things here, and I think we touched on this in the earlier segment, is that patients should be referred for a consultation. Yeah. So if you get the diagnosis of lung cancer, it's very important to get them over to the medical oncologist so we can walk them through all of these points that we have just discussed, talking about your comorbidities, talking about your performance status, and managing that with what we think would be the best treatment option for you, especially yeah. when we're potentially aiming for a curative therapy. Right. And I really think that the onus is on us as oncologists to communicate with the primary care doctor, or the internist, pick up your phone, call them, and say, this is why I think this patient may have a shot, because really that's what's going to change their viewpoints. Um, I think it's one thing to write it in a chart, but if you actually personally communicate with these mm -hmm. referring providers, it goes a long way. Yeah, I think that uh, having that discussion with them, my, my concern is, is, you know, what are the strategies we should be thinking about for those patients who... Um, uh, you know, get, they talk to their primary care mm -hmm. doctor. They probably don't get adequate staging. Uh, they they probably don't get referred. Uh, we never have that opportunity to make a phone call to to say I, I think we can help here. Um, you know, what are the strategies there? I mentioned national organizations. Uh, I've mentioned tumor boards, but these are the type of physicians that probably aren't coming to tumor board to, to, to kind of hear, hear the message. Anyone have any thoughts about, about uh, strategies uh, um, from, a, from a primary care point of view? So I think we can work on going out into the community ourselves yes. and giving talks, giving seminars. I know we frequently reach out. We have a physician liaison group, for example, that goes out into the community, kind of gauges what they want, what they need, what they want to hear from us, and we'll build seminars around that. So I do, I do agree that the onus is on the medical oncologists, the radiation oncologists, maybe at the bigger centers to go out into the community and educate. We can also look at it from the patient perspective also. There's a lot of patient advocacy groups now that we can leverage yeah. where I think giving the patients the power to ask the questions um, and knowing which questions to ask so that they're going to be able to move forward in the correct fashion. And if I have a take home message here, I say it's make sure that patients are referred. Um, I think most of us are familiar with the staging, the guidelines, the recommendations on how to treat the patients, and if we can just get them in the door to the medical oncologist, to the radiation oncologist, so we can provide that breast care, I think that's, that should be the take-home message.
it's very, very, very important that we refer every patient to get chemo radiation that's a candidate that we stage appropriately and that we don't deprive patients of potentially curable therapy.